Awesome. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Whew, isn't it great to be at God's presence? So I love our church. Awesome. Awesome. You may find one as good, but you won't find one any better. And uh, that goes for our worship band. I tell you what, they, they, they bring it every week, and I'm so grateful for them. I hope you are too. And I am grateful for you. You guys are here on New Year's Day. Wow, what is wrong with you? That's exciting. I tell you what, it is the new year, and today God's Word has some powerful, powerful truths for us. How to start this year stress-free. Is there anybody who would like a stress-free new year? It's not just me, is it? Okay, all right, well, you are in the right place. You have come to the right place. I started last year with a similar theme. In fact, I put up a little uh, Disney quote, and I want you to tell me, what does this actually mean? Anybody remember? No No worries. Yes, good job. Have you ever met anybody who could actually live this out? Those people who are always calm, those people who are always poised, and they're never panic, and they're never rattled, and they never seem dis, you know, discombobulated or caught off guard. You ever know anybody like that? Don't they just get on your nerves? You're just like, like what is, how do you do that? You know, well, they, chances are they're believers if they really have peace, if they really have, have it together like that. And we all have some of those people that we look up to and we admire, and, you know, and we think, wow, they just got it. You know, for me, it's like David Jeremiah and O.S. Hawkins and Billy Graham and some of these legends that I, I look up to. But we all have that one friend, that one friend who just doesn't quite know how to handle stress. It just doesn't seem, and, and this right here, this expression, this is how some of y'all were in 2016. Is there anybody ready to flush 2016? Is there anybody? Yeah, a couple? Okay, I know. We lost a lot of good people in 2016. 2017 is going to be awesome. Sometimes, if nothing else, it helps just to look at something adorable when you're dealing with stress, like this. I'm sorry, I'm just stressed. And I didn't leave out you dog lovers. Fear not. Sorry you're stressed. I love you. (laughs) And you are loved here. And this is what we're going to look at today, because some of us are stressed, some of us, we need something in our lives like this. Let me show you what this is here. Anybody recognize this? Oh, stress ball. Straight from heaven's throne. Right here. Anybody have one? Yeah? Does it work? Yeah. Does it? <laughs> Leanne says yes, wholeheartedly. Some of you need to keep one of these on you at all times. Let's be honest. And it's okay. You're at the potter's hand. You're safe here. It's okay to, to, to take your mask off and say, we don't have it all together. Some of you need a stress ball a little, big, a little bigger. Some of you, let's just be honest, you need a stress ball the size of Manhattan. This is what you need. And you need, when you're uh, getting ready to go back to work this week, you need to hug that stress ball. Just squeeze it, right? Or maybe you're uh, getting ready to do your taxes because it's the end of the year. And you're paying the bills. And you got Squeeze that stress ball just a little bit more, right? Right? Or maybe, maybe you have a different water balloon in your life that's stressful. Maybe for you it's driving, in traffic, at rush hour, at crossroads, or Beaver Creek. <laughs> just want to hold that stress ball because I'm going to make this thing pop because that's my button. And I've confessed that to you freely. I admit that. And, and there's, there's safety in confession here. Here you go. That's for you, baby. Don't say I didn't get you anything for Christmas. There it is. Today, God's word is going to help us do better than a stress ball. So if you are ready to jump in, turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Pull up your favorite Bible app. We're going to look at verse 25 through 34. While you pull that up, let me welcome those who are streaming with us. I know we have a lot of people at home under the weather praying for you to get better. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 25. I'll put it up on the screen so you can follow along with me. Let's just dive into this together. And it says, therefore, I say to you, who's this talking, by the way? Jesus, that's right, these are the red letters, absolutely. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't toil or spin, yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God, who so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is gone, is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Verse 31, therefore, 
do not worry, saying, what do we eat? What do we drink? What should we wear? For all these things, man, the Gentiles seek after that. Remember that, okay? We're going to come back to that. That's a little rebuke right there. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God in his righteousness. All these other things will be added to you. Therefore, he says it again, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for today is its own troubles. Whoo! That is some deep gold for us, church. One of my favorite pastoral books, I love to read it, is from O.S. Hawk. It's called The Jesus Code. And he addresses this exact passage, and he asks a great question. He zeroes in on one of these questions, and I love it, and it really got me thinking. And the question was this. Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? And that got me thinking. So I want to ask you a question, okay? Do not hear me. Do not answer this out loud, okay? This way you can be honest, all right? You with me? Not if you're with me. I'm going to ask you a question. Answer it to yourself, just you and the Lord. Do you consider yourself a worrier? Don't nudge your spouse. I saw that. That's between you and the Lord, Okay. Do you consider yourself a word? Do you consider yourself a ball of stress? Are you that nervous cat? <laughs> you know, you came into church with a full head of hair, but you just leave because you're just like, whoa. I mean, you're just constantly stressing like a cat in a rocking chair convention. You just know that that thing is going to come and get you at one point or the other. Where, where? In fact, let's let's break this down. On a stressometer, where are you? Okay, on a scale of one to ten, here's a here's a one or a two. Cool, you're chilled, you got it. Maybe a three or a four. You're coping, but you're okay. Stressed? I bet a lot of us live right here. This is your neighborhood on a good day. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, full blown panic attack. Where are you on our stressometer? Because today God's word is going to reveal four things to us that are going to show us how ridiculous we can be and how much we don't need to internalize this stress. Because it is bad news, it is like a poison. There is a, there's something in this passage we just read that teaches us something. The word worry and stress, you know what it literally means? It means to be pulled apart in opposite directions. That's what worry literally means. To be ripped apart at the seams. To literally be shredded. That's what worry, stress means. You know when you tell someone, be careful? You know where that came from? You're literally telling them to be full of care or full of worry. Be careful driving home. Be full of care. Be full of work. You know, it's like we, inter- we don't even realize how much we internalize this in our daily uh, comings and goings. So to be anxious and stressed and worried, according to God's word, is to be torn apart by circumstances. That is not a pretty picture, to be shredded like that. Worry and stress is like poison. Poison is bad. When we drink that, it starts to have an effect. And God is not just saying, hey, it's kind of a good idea to avoid this or to to trust me in some things occasionally if you remember me. Not at all. There is an admonition all the time. Let's be honest. There is a lot to be stressed about. Turn on the news. Pull up Drudge Report. You'll see it. There is line item after line item of things to be stressed about. I get it. We understand that. No wonder so many of us spend our time stressed out. For us, this, if we're honest, is our motto. I stress about stress before there's even stress to stress about. Then I stress about stressing over stress that doesn't need to be stressed about, and it's stressful, right? This is, this is you know somebody. I see you smiling right now. You know somebody. Maybe it's you. Don't point. You know, I see some of you doing that. I'm not pointing to Amy. She's not doing it. Good. No, she's awesome. But we all know somebody, okay? Just tr- I'm serious. She is awesome. This, this is not about her. I prompt not you either, Milo. We're good. When we worry about something and we stress, let's be honest, okay, we have to start here. Most of the things we stress about never come to pass. You with me? Most of the things we think we're worried about or we're panicked about or we have anxiety over, 95% of that, that stuff that you worried about would happen this past year, never did. Do you think this looks good on us? Does stress look good on anyone, let alone followers of Christ. We're better than that, man. The world is looking to to us as his ambassadors to be peace, to be love, to be that breath of fresh air when we walk into a room. I mean, it's almost like we have bought the lie that stressing is no big deal. 
If you really want to eradicate stress and bring this down in your world, you have to grasp this underlying truth, okay? Are you ready? This is your first truth grenade for the day. God doesn't just frown upon our worry. He actually forbids it. He forbids it. He doesn't just look at it and go, oh, there you go, stressing again, you're worried. No, no, no. He doesn't just frown on it. His word expressly forbids it. For the follower of Christ, we are not supposed to be overwhelmed by this world because we worship the one who has overcome the world. Maybe we need a reminder as we start 2017 to stake a bolder step of faith for him and say, you know what? I'm done. Like those songs, man, I am casting my cares aside. I am done. No more am I going to let the devil steal my victory and I'm going to walk around like a nervous cat. No more. No more. Maybe 2016, fine. You know what? Flush it. There it goes. 2017 is here. It is a fresh start, and we need to get these truths, okay? The first thing we need to grasp as we look at this passage in Matthew, we have got to finally admit that stressing out is foolish. It is foolish. It is so counterproductive. Notice the context of Jesus' question in this passage. He comes up, and he's encouraging everyone to look around at the birds of the air, and he says, guys, they don't plant, they don't crop, they don't gather the harvest, they don't build little bird barns out in the woods, they don't have little bird storehouses, there is no great tree in the middle with lots of traffic around it called Bird Costco. <laughs> You've been there. There's no little bird buggies trying to get in and out and doing it where they get their food. God feeds them. He provides for every single one of their needs. Our Heavenly Father takes this so seriously, it prompts Jesus to ask this question, are you not of more value than they? Goofy little birds. We read later in chapter 10 that they're sold two for a single copper piece. And we read that not one falls to the ground without the Father's knowledge. Not one. And Jesus comes along and he says, guys, it totally makes sense that my heavenly Father will provide for your needs. You are worth so much more than a goofy little bird. He will take care of you. And maybe, just right there, maybe somebody just needed to hear that. Maybe you are struggling. Maybe it's, it's tough making it end, ends meet just going from day to day. God sees that. He knows that. Maybe you just need to hear, he has promised to take care of your needs. He has. You will never see a believer go hungry. You won't see it. Otherwise, that means God has lied. You will not see that. You will, it, it, let, me, let me clarify this. God did not say he will take care of your wants. Are you with me? He said our needs, the basic things. He said he would provide. We can't go to God and say, I really, really need a 2017 red Ferrari, God. I really, that is a want, okay? That is not a need. All right, so hear me say that. Hear me say that, okay? It is not about that. There, there is a song, in fact, it's, it's so beautiful. He talks about the, this bird and his eye being on us. Anybody know what song I'm talking about? You can find it in the hymnal years ago. Is that, not free bird. Who said that? <laughs> no. If you think I'm as free as a bird now, and that makes you feel spiritual, all right, go for it. But I'm thinking, for his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. That's beautiful. That is it. A free bird, again, if that's your thing, go for it. But I'm going with his eyes on the sparrow because Jesus is talking about it. He says, it falls to the ground and God knows it and you're worth so much more. So don't stress, guys. It is foolish, which leads us to the next point. Stressing is futile. Woo! Stressing is futile. Not only is resistance to the Borg futile, but stressing is futile. How many got that Star Trek reference? Anybody? Seven people. What a shame. Okay. Not only is it foolish to worry, Church, it is futile. To help us realize this, notice what Jesus does next in this passage. He asks a very simple and very pointed question. He says, which of you, by worrying, and he's pointing, you can see it, which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? Now, when you first read this, you might think he's talking about an element of, of height here. But a cubit is 18 inches. So it seems a little out of context for Jesus to say, which of you, by worrying, can make yourself grow a foot and a half? So upon further research, you actually learn that the term cubit can also mean a duration of time, which is why some of your translations say this instead. Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? Okay, well now this is starting to make some sense. Worrying, stressing does not add anything to your life. It doesn't add, anything to, doesn't add any hair to your head. It doesn't add any stature in your community. 
doesn't add to a better seed in the church. It doesn't add anything. It's nothing. It does no good. In fact, worrying will actually do the opposite. Stressing out, if you ask any doctor, takes a toll on your health. You know what I'm saying? Have you ever met anybody who's just sick and they're so stressed out? Man, it is so, it is poison. It literally eats you from the inside. The real question is this. Now, each one of these points is going to get a little bit more, uh, I don't want to say uncomfortable because I don't want you to think that, but uncomfortable. Each one of these, here, here's the question. Do we really believe that our days are in God's hands? In 2017, do we believe it? Because our actions will reveal the answer. When we look at Psalm, we see that our days are already numbered. Check this out. Psalm 139, I'll put it up for you. It says, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. That tells me that God has our days in hand. And to stress is so futile. What this, what this says, when we find ourselves stressed, guess what we do? Let's be honest, right? We start plotting and scheming for a way out of the stress, right? First thing we do, flight, boom. How can I limit the stress? This is the easiest and quickest response, but it may not be the right response. We will scheme and plot and come up with a way to alleviate stress, and then what's the next thing we do? We hurry off to implement that plan, that genius plan that we came up with while we were stressed, while we were not in a great frame of mind anyway. Here's the only problem. Nowhere in Scripture do we see Jesus hurrying off to ever do anything. In fact, when his buddy died, he lingered two more days. Talk about cool under pressure. Man, this guy, Jesus is cooler than the other side of the pillow. He is one of those people that you will never see rattled. You will never see stressed. You will never see panicked. Never once in Scripture do we see Jesus hurrying under duress to do anything. You don't see him in the Gospels. Disciples, y'all need to hurry up. <laughs> we gotta go. I got a miracle. I want, I want to raise this guy from the dead a little bit. And I just pulled up my iPhone weather app, and it says there's a storm coming. And I really wanted to walk on that water and calm the storm. Because I had this great miracle. Because you are running late, I am going to miss my miracle. It's not in there. It's not in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, second hesitations. It's in none of them. Because Jesus showed us the example. One of the hardest lessons for us to learn Get this, the hardest thing for us to learn is to wait on the Lord. But waiting on the Lord is the key to overcoming your stress. Let me put it another way. Waiting, not hurrying, waiting rather than hurrying is the hallmark of a mature believer. And I wish that were not so. I wish I could take that bullet point down and not have anybody write it down because that means I'm accountable now because I know truth. Waiting is the hallmark of a mature believer. In 2017, do you want to take your faith to the next level? Only you can answer that. If you do, well, we got to migrate from that first word to that one, two, well, from that uh, fourth word to that first word, to be hurrying and stressing. And I see it. some of you are still pointing at your spouse right now. Don't do that. You're giving it away, okay? This is, this is for everybody. Waiting on the Lord is one of these things. This is why the psalm says this in Psalm 130. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. I say it again, more than they who watch for the morning. This is incredible. These are the people on the guard towers waiting for sunrise. Not only because the enemies could attack under cover of darkness and they were vulnerable, but this reveals two gems, hidden gold right here. The first thing it teaches us is that you and I have to wait for the sunrise. Do we like to wait? Not one of us can hurry up that sunrise. Not, there's nothing we can do to speed it up, to rush it. We can't go to a clock and move it ahead. We can't, and it drives us nuts because we want to be in control so bad. God is in control. We have to wait for the sunrise. Even if you've told your kids, and you made a foolish promise on Christmas morning, don't come wake me up until you see the sunrise, and they're jumping on your bed saying, it's sunrise. And sure enough, nothing they could have done made that sun come up any sooner. That's the first thing it reveals. The sun will come up when God decrees it. It will not rise any sooner. The second thing that this shows us is the sun always rises. There's always, he supposes that. That's already assumed. Don't miss this. The assumption here is every time the sun has set, God has made it rise. From time beginning until he returns and makes all things new, this has happened. 
You didn't stop it. I didn't stop it. No nuclear war stopped it. No climate change stopped it. God is in control of his universe. Oh, I guess you didn't hear me. God is in control of his universe. Okay, eight of you believe it. That's awesome. Okay, as we look at this, this should reveal to us God's timing is what we count on. He is perfect. His timing is perfect. Stressing and worrying over unsolved problems is going to ruin your fresh start. Corrie ten Boom says something awesome. She's the great lady who rescued all these Jews during Nazi Germany. She said this, guys, when you're stressing, it does not worry. Worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows. All it does is it empties today of its strength. Put another way, when you are stressing and you're thinking about tomorrow so much that you are panicked and you've got that worry, wrinkle, furrow brow, and your face is breaking out because you're so stressed out and your hair is falling out, Corey Ten Boom, the one who had reason to stress, says, guys, you're not getting ahead. You're not, you can't rob tomorrow's stress and bring it over here and pack it in today. No, no, no. And then we remember what Jesus said. Today's got enough of its own. Let me handle tomorrow. You can't handle it even if you think you can. I created the universe. And he gives us permission to cast our carries, our cares on him. Worrying does not empty tomorrow of its trials. It'll rob it of its strength. It's futile. And the next thing we see is stressing is frustrating. Oh, now it's getting real. Stressing is so frustrating. In Matthew 6, notice what Jesus does next. He turns his attention to the little flowers growing in the field, to the lilies. Tiptoe through the tulips, right? He, he's sitting there and he's got his disciples around and he's talking to them and he says, guys, look at this. Notice they don't toil, they don't spin, they don't go out and get little flower clothes or anything, yet God takes care of them. They don't punch a time clock. They're not freaking out over traffic. And then he specifically tells them, consider how they grow. Why did he do that? Because especially back then, growth was a mystery. They had no clue why you put a seed in the ground and it looks dead, and then days later, it sprouts flowers, blossoms, stalk, and all kinds of leaves. They don't understand how that... They didn't know why a speck of protoplasm, invisible to our human eye, suddenly becomes us if you leave it alone. And it grows a circulatory system and a respiratory system and a, and a, and all, a digestive system, and it, it's just, it is incredible. In winter, that little bulb that we plant under the ground gets covered with frost and snow and ice, and it looks so dead. But what happens when the spring comes? It sprouts up, and it's beautiful, and it's awesome. And God says, I care about this, and I dress them. Don't you think I'll care more about you? And he goes on, and he's saying, I am the God of glory. I watch over all these little things. Do you see how the lilies grow? God does that. My heavenly Father does that. Jesus is rebuking the disciples. And then he, he goes on, he does something really surprising here in a minute, and I promise I, I, I'll come to it. The moment we cut the flower off the stem, what happens to it? it? Begins to wilt and die. Because it is temporary, but not you. You are immortal. And if God cares about this silly flower, will he not more care about you? Some of us need to just internalize that today and say, forgive me, Lord. No wonder you're frustrated with my lack of faith here. This is, this is a basic premise for Christianity. Do we trust God when he says what he says? He says, I've got this. In 2017, I will take care of you. There is a catch, and we're going to come to that. If our eyes are focused on everything but him, it will wear you out. Corey Ten Boom goes on in this interview to say one more incredible quote. She says, if you're, just, if you're distracted and you're looking at the world, you will be distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed. Only when you look at Christ will you be at rest. This lady knew what she was talking about. Choose to focus on him, not your worries. Okay? Are you with me on that? Now, I said all of that, and I saved this last point for the very backside, for the end. Because... This might sting a little. <clears throat> Sorry, anybody been to the doctor? I love it when they, they got a shot and they go, this might tickle. <laughs> what? Dude, if that is your definition of tickle, we are not even on the same planet because it, that did not tickle. This one, this might, <laughs> this might sting just a little bit, okay? And I'm going to be honest. Do I have permission to present a little bit of a, of, a, of a truth we all need? Yes? Yes? Okay, all right. For the 80% that said yes, awesome. The rest of you, just close your eyes, close your ears, and, just, and, and, and we'll, we'll get through this together. Stressing reveals something, and it is not pretty. It holds up a mirror, and it reveals a faithless attitude. I don't like this. Oh, I don't like this. 
I wish this wasn't part of this message. I wish Jesus didn't teach this because this spanks me. Notice the next question Jesus asked. And he's very direct here. He says, if God so clothes the grass of the field, will he not much more clothe you? And then he does something he rarely does. He zings him and says, oh, you of little faith. What? Jesus, he just, just a, it wasn't a big spanking. It was just a little, little pat. Just a little do-do-do, <laughs> right? On the disciples and those gathered around, Sermon on the Mount type stuff. He says, oh, you of little faith. He does it almost never does he do this gentle rebuke. He's reminding us that a lack of faith is something that is not pleasing in our Father's sight. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Having a lack of faith, it's, it's well, let's just quote it right here. Christopher, you got that? Oh, I think we have this famous guy who says, I find your lack of faith disturbing. Not only does Vader, but evidently the Lord doesn't like this. And here is the reason. When we look at the Sermon on the Mount, Almost everything that we see about spiritual maturity is more than just actions. It involves our reactions. Think about this. In the Sermon on the Mount, he says, if someone strikes you on one cheek, what are we supposed to do? Turn the other. If someone asks for your tunic, we're supposed to also give them our cloak. And if a soldier comes and says, I want you to go with me one mile, what are we supposed to do? Go two miles. It is, it is not just about our actions, it is about our reactions. When we are controlled by the Spirit, our reactions are controlled by the Spirit. We're not in the flesh. But when we, when we are operating in the world of stress, I don't think we like our reactions. Because sometimes they get the better of us. And, and, and we see this. Faith and worry are reactions to events in life. When we are governed by God and His peace, we will react to stressful situations through faith. But when we are not governed by God or his peace, we will likely react with stress. And we will not like our behaviors because of it. Is this making sense to some? Yeah, some of you know exactly. You can go back and look at a stressful situation. You think, man, I wish I could have handled that better, right? You with me? Is it just me? Okay, it's just me. Cool. All right, whatever. Here's the thing. If stress is poison, the good news about God's word is he always provides the antidote. You ready for the antidote? Throw it up there, Chris. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all these things will be added to you. Notice that word on the bottom that starts with an S. All these things, what? Shall, shall, not might. He's saying, if you put me first, I'll take care of the other. I love how the New Living says. It says this, church, seek the kingdom of God above all else. And don't miss this, live righteously. How are you doing on that? Are you there? Can you kick it up a notch in 2017? Can you take your faith more? All right, just, uh, and then he goes on to say this, live righteously and he will give you everything you need. This is a promise from Jesus. You know what that means? It's the red letters. I mean, it's great if it's Paul. It's great if it's Peter. It's great if it's one of the prophets. This is Jesus. God incarnate saying, guys, We will take care of everything you need if you just take the blinders off and focus on me and gaze at me and and revel in my awesomeness. I will smooth out your road. It's a promise. These are red letters. Now, that sounds straightforward, right? Woo! Well, it is simple, but I will never tell you it's easy. I will never lie to you. I will never say... (laughs) <laughs> Tiptoe through the through. Christianity is easy, it's awesome. Just follow God and you won't have any problems because that is not what this says. That's, it's not even close. But it does provide the path, the antidote of ordering your day. Here, here's, here's the rub. This is where this is all coming. This is where it starts to get a little bit, little bit awkward, a little bit uncomfortable. Only you, only you can decide to order your day to include God, to where you can seek him first. Just going to set that right there. Only you can structure your day in such a way that you are living out this antidote. I can't do it for you, and you can't do it for me. It'd be great if we could, 
but only you can do this. Only you can structure your day to have time for him, to seek his kingdom, to read his word, to structure your day, to leave time for prayer, to structure your day, to leave time to meet with brothers and sisters in Christ, not forsaking the assemblies. Only you have that power to control your day. When we meet him, our worries take on a whole different perspective. When we meet him, our stresses now become seen in his heavenly perspective. Isn't that what you want? To see them for what they really are? Because the devil is a master at making your problems right here consume your vision to where that is all you think about. Not if you know what I'm talking about. All right, okay, good. This is what the devil does. He wants to say, man, no one else is dealing with this. This is just you. You're the only one struggling with this. What kind of Christian are you? You're the only one that's wrestled with that sin. Man, you call yourself a believer? Man, you play for Ohio State. He's just one of the, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I was actually pulling for him. I really was. So here's, sorry, I just had to lighten the mood because y'all are looking really, really stressed. And that is the whole opposite of what I'm going for here. When we look at this, here's, here's the deal, okay? And this, this is your truth grenade that I want to leave you with, okay? And this is, this is one of the largest statements I can make as your pastor, okay? This, if I can help you in any way that helps me in my own walk, when God is in control of our day, he always leaves room for himself. Write it down and count on it. When God is in control of your day, he will always, say always, always leave room for himself. Now here's the part that might sting a little. If this is true, the opposite is true. If you do not have room for God in your day, God is not in control of your schedule. Ow! Just a little spanking. Because here, here's, here's the deal. If our days are so jammed full of stuff and activities, it, 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 they could be good things, but if they don't leave room for the greatest thing, there is a great chance you have picked up something in your schedule that he didn't assign. Should we be picking up things that God didn't assign? Negatory. Put it down. God never wants us to be frazzled. What kind of God do your neighbors see when they watch you? Do they see a, a child of God who is filled with peace? Or do they see someone who is running nonstop from event to event, from work to job number two, event after one after the other? And then do they see a God who never lets you rest? What do they see? Think about it. What a great challenge for us. I'm sorry, it's kind of hard, but this is, again, this is not for you. This is all for me today. This is just for me. I'm preaching to myself. This is a little mirror right here, okay? What do, what do they see? Because if God is in control of your day, I promise you, his word, he will leave room for himself. This is one of the few times God says, I am a jealous God. Can you believe that? He actually wants you to spend time with him kind of awesome God do we serve? That he cares for us that much, that he wants us to come and linger in his presence. So here's my challenge. Here it is. Are you ready? We're going to do something different today. We're all going to come up and do some crunches on this ball. Come. <laughs> this is your stress ball. This could be 2016. This could be something you're thinking of right now in 2017. And you know what I'm talking about because it's the thing that just raced through your mind. This is your job. This is your report you're waiting to hear back from the doctor. This is something you're, a phone call you're waiting to hear back from a, a family member. This could be anything, whatever it is that is stressing you out. This is your water balloon that you saw in the beginning where you're just like, no, okay. I want us to take our ball of stress and lay it right here at the foot of the cross where it belongs, okay? That's the easy part. Here's the part that I'm really gonna challenge us with. Leave it there. That's my challenge. Take your stress ball and look, drop it at the altar. Put it down. Now listen, don't, don't do this. I gotta pick it back. I got I just, I love it. I will pet it. I will call it George. It's just one of my, my favorite stress balls. I love, I, I gotta think about, Pastor, you don't understand. I must think about this and obsess it because if I don't, I don't know what else I would think about. Pastor, you don't understand. If I put it, you know what? Here's the deal. If you think about it again, I'm going to give you the secret. Take that thought captive and resubmit it to the Lord. 
Take it, put it in your spiritual box and say, no, Satan, I rebuke that and I am submitting this to the Lord and I am going to put it in his hands and I'm not going to start worrying about it and take it back out of his hands. Pastor, if I do that, I will do that 17 times a day. Yes, yes, that's the point. Now, guess what you've done? You've just prayed 17 times that you probably weren't doing before. You know what that means? Guess what you've done? You followed the scripture that says pray without ceasing. Breath prayer. It doesn't mean walk around blind all day with your eyes closed, wrecking your car. It means breath prayer. Say a prayer that can last a breath. And No, I'm not going to worry about it again. I'm going to leave it here. That's our challenge today. Only you know what it is. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray for you today. I'm going to have our instrumentalists come up. Guys, just play something softly. We're not going to sing. I want to pray for the church. In fact, what we'll do, if you're able and you can join me at the altar, I would love to start the new year kneeling before the Lord. If your body and your health allows you, just come join. You won't all be able to get here. You can sit down the aisles or whatever. Put your hand on the person in front of you if you want. God honors unity, and it is probably the highest privilege I have to pray for you. And I want to pray for your year. I want to pray for your families. I want to pray for your health, your finances, everything. So here's what we're going to do. If you can make it, come up. If you can't, just stay right where you are. It's no big deal. But stand with me now and just make your way down front. And let's just, as a church, give the Lord 2017. And we're going to pray right now and give him our ball of stress, whatever it is that is holding us back.